Coming up on this episode of Photography Online. We show you the best way to capture amazing rainbow shots. We go on location to some of the Lake District's top spots. And Marcus photographs an oven. Welcome to your favourite photography show today, coming to you from the beautiful English Lake District, which we'll be exploring very soon. Before we do that though, here's our usual quick photography question just for fun. What was the programme that became Photoshop originally called? A. Pro Edit, B. Image Flow, C. Photo Suite, or D. Image Pro? We'll give you that answer later on in the show. All right, well, if like most of the Photography Online team, you live in a part of the world where it rains a lot, then one consolation might be that at least you get to see a lot of rainbows. Single ones, double ones, and sometimes even moonbows. Rainbows can often be the cherry on the cake in a landscape photo, but if they appear without warning, then they can take us unawares and we might miss the shot. However, with a little foresight and know-how, we can maximise our chances of success. Here's Marcus to tell us how to make the most of these fleeting moments. If you want your photos to be viewed with a symphony of oohs and ahs, then you could do a lot worse than head out and shoot rainbows. Rainbows contain all the colours visible to our eyes and stretch majestically across the landscape, so naturally they have photographers reaching for their gear. You could be forgiven for thinking that rainbows are actually quite difficult to predict and it's just down to luck whether you're in the right place at the right time. But rainbows are actually quite easy to predict and position within our frame. To allow us to do this, we need to understand the physics at work. Rainbows need two elements, sunlight and airborne water. When these two elements collide, white light from the sun, which is actually made up of the entire colour spectrum, gets reflected by the millions of water droplets back towards our eyes. At the periphery of this reflection, the different wavelengths of visible light get separated and appear to our eyes as a rainbow. Rainbows are always full circles, but we actually only get to see the proportion above the horizon. If we visualise them as a full circle, then the centre of the circle will always be exactly 180 degrees opposite to the sun from our viewpoint. This means that two people standing next to each other will see two different rainbows, as they each have their own unique perspective. It's good to think that the rainbow that you are looking at is only viewable by you, nobody else can see it. But what this means is that we can move a rainbow left and right by moving ourselves left and right, so they're relatively easy to position in our scene, as I've done here to come out of the spire of a church. As a rainbow is always opposite the sun, it will appear to move in relation to objects on our revolving planet. So if you want your rainbow precisely aligned in a landscape, be aware that it won't be in one place for more than a minute or so. If the sun is high in the sky, then we'll only ever be able to see the very top portion of the rainbow, as the majority of it will be below the horizon. Remember that the centre of the circle will always be opposite the sun. When the sun is near the horizon, we see almost half the circle, which appears much higher in the sky. It's possible to see a full circle rainbow, but you need to be up high looking downwards, such as from an aeroplane or a mountain summit. One interesting fact about rainbows is they're all exactly the same size, but they can appear either near or far away. Depending on this distance, we see them as being different sizes as we use objects at a similar distance as our reference of scale. For example, if a rainbow is far away, it may dwarf a distant tree and therefore look much bigger than if we were standing closer to the tree, in which case the rainbow would still be the same size but the tree would be much bigger in comparison. Assuming we can see around half of a rainbow, i.e. the sides are hitting the ground at 90 degrees, then the width of the rainbow will perfectly fill the frame of a 24mm lens on a full frame camera. This is because rainbows are always 84 degrees in width, exactly the same angle of view as a 24mm lens. 
This is useful to know if we chance across a rainbow and need to decide quickly which lens to use. Another good tip is to use a polarizer. Generally speaking, a polarizing filter won't have much impact when pointing your lens either directly towards or away from the sun. But when it comes to rainbows, which are always opposite the sun, they do have a remarkable effect. As we turn the filter to its least effective setting, the rainbow almost completely disappears. But as we rotate the filter to its maximum setting, the full vibrance of the rainbow comes through, appearing much more saturated in the camera than it does to the naked eye. It is possible to get a double rainbow, where the light is reflected twice to create a fainter inverted rainbow outside the more vibrant main rainbow. This will require a focal length of around 16 millimeters on a full frame camera to include the entirety of the wider arc. The fact that the colors on the second rainbow are inverted has caught out a couple of well-known photographers in the past when they artificially added a rainbow or two here and there in their landscape images and then claimed them to be authentic. What they failed to do was invert the colours on the second rainbow, which incriminated themselves and in the process, they lost the respect of a lot of other photographers. Basically, if you're going to cheat, don't take people as fools, otherwise you will get caught out. Although rare, it is possible to get triple and quadruple rainbows, where the light from each raindrop is reflected multiple times. In this instance here, when we were filming a previous episode of Photography Online, we saw a quadruple rainbow, but it's really just a double double rainbow, with the second one being created from light bouncing off the water. As this angle is coming from below the horizon, the second rainbow appears as more than a semicircle. You might notice that the area inside a rainbow is brighter than the area outside. This is due to all the colours merging in this area to create white light. Think of a rainbow as a circle of reflected light, where the edges of the circle are refracted into individual colours, but essentially, the only part of a rainbow which we ever notice is this colourful part. Earlier on, I claimed that rainbows are reasonably easy to predict, but how does one do this? Well, head out when the sun is reasonably low on the horizon, because the lower the sun is, the higher the rainbow will be. If the sun's above 42 degrees above the horizon, or in other words, your shadow is less tall than you are, then it's impossible to see a rainbow, at least from ground level. Choose a day when the weather forecast suggests a mixture of sunshine and showers. Here in the UK, April would be an ideal time. Here on Sky, rainbows in April are an almost daily occurrence. Make a note of which way the wind is blowing from, as this will likely be the same direction the clouds are moving in. For argument's sake, let's say the wind is blowing from the west. Now, in the morning, the sun will be in the east. So all we need to do is keep a lookout to the west for any approaching rain showers, and we'll observe a rainbow before the shower hits us. If in the afternoon or evening, the sun will also be in the west. So any approaching rain showers will have to pass over us. We're gonna to have to get wet before we observe a beautiful rainbow to the east after the shower has passed. Rainbows can last from just a couple of seconds, if the light is fleeting, to many hours. Depending on which source you read, the longest living rainbow was either in Taiwan, where it was reported to be almost nine hours, or Sheffield in England, where it was just over six hours. It's probably worth remembering that a rainbow on its own isn't really a good enough subject to make a great photo. Ideally, you want to find a scene which works well without a rainbow, but is all the better for the inclusion of one. One final piece of advice, if you want to capture really colourful and vibrant rainbows, don't shoot them in black and white. So hopefully that was useful and if you managed to capture some great rainbow shots then do send them in to us and we'll showcase a selection of our favourites in our December show. I popped a link with more details which you can find in the show description underneath the video which is down here somewhere. 
All right, well, as I mentioned earlier, I'm here in the beautiful Lake District in the north of England, a location which is hugely popular with landscape photographers due to its beautiful and accessible scenery. With hills, woods, and of course, lakes, it also has a great variety of photo spots to choose from if you're heading out with your camera. Not knowing the area myself though, and with so many locations to choose from, I enlisted the knowledge of a local pro photographer for some expert guidance. Ask any UK photographer where their favourite landscape location is and the chances are they will say the Lake District. Home to England's biggest and deepest lakes, nestled amongst its tallest hills, is no wonder it attracts so many photographers. Our base of photography online is on the Isle of Skye in Scotland, somewhere we know like the back of our hands. But when it comes to the Lake District, there are many people who know it far better than we do. So, rather than pretend we know what we're talking about, we thought we'd enlist the help of a local pro. Some might even say legend, but as his mum isn't here at the moment, we'll just go with pro. Chris Sale has been living and working in the Lake District as a full-time landscape photographer for over three years, so knows it better than most. Our time here is limited, so instead of wasting precious hours exploring this vast area of almost 1,000 square miles by ourselves, Chris has kindly offered to show us three of his favourite locations, taking into account the conditions we have here today. So Chris, this is a beautiful spot, but where exactly are we? So we're on Derwent Water, we're in the Northern Lake District, mm -hmm. and this is an area called Otterbield. And we have the famous Otterbeel tree, which has been photographed many times. But what's so good about this view is that, that we're looking back towards the direction of Keswick, mm -hmm. the town of Keswick. And uh, we have a Skiddaw, which is uh, the fourth or fifth highest mountain in the Lake District. Okay. And then behind that we have Blencathra. And when it's reasonably calm as it is this morning, we get these beautiful triangle shapes with the mountains in the reflections. In so, the water here, absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. So the shot that we're going to go for um, is going to be of the tree mm -hmm. um, with uh, the hills behind. And the thing you have to be careful of is not to get the uh, tripod too high so that the tree cuts into the mountain in the background. Okay, yeah. Okay. Watching for contact. Okay. Now you also want to come over as far as you can to the right hand side so that you're lining the tree up and you're looking past the tree towards okay. the mountain. So what's a good focal length? I mean, I've got just my basic 24 to 1 and Yeah, that's going to be fine. I think you can only be somewhere between 24 and 35. Okay. Um, and what you want to try to do is balance the uh, tree mm -hmm. uh, with the island. Okay, so further over. Yeah, I'd come over. So, so like getting that. that underneath it, perhaps? Yeah, that looks good. Maybe a bit, bit tighter, so zoom in a touch. That looks pretty good. Yeah? Yeah, that looks nice. You've got the reflections going on there as yep. well. So Chris, tell me, is this the best kind of time of day to come here or, I mean, what are you looking for? Are you looking for just still waters for the yeah, reflection? Yeah, so or? typically when planning a shoot down by the edge of the lake, um, we'll look for still conditions, a little wind. Yeah. What I tend to do here, if I can, is come on a nice overcast day when it's um, nice and bright, but it's nice diffuse light and that means that the exposure is much easier. And you know, this is a fairly spectacular view. It doesn't really need colour as well. It's in a bonus, but uh, I like still and kind of bright and overcast for here. So, okay. Do we have too much sky at the top, do you think? Or is it because it's quite dark? It's not. It's really reasonably good? well balanced. If you look at the space at the bottom of the frame and the space at the top of the frame, that's reasonably well balanced. And if you're presenting this, you might want to crop it to uh, a 10 by eight. So exposure wise, we're just kind of touching the highlights there. Do you want me to, what have we got, 125 and 6.3? Yeah, so you're going to want to be, uh, I would have thought for this, we're going to be focusing somewhere around two meters away from the camera. Okay. So you want to be at F11. F11. And that means that you're going to be sharp from about a meter to infinity. Okay, okay. That looks pretty good, give it a go. Nice. Good composition. Yeah, it works. 
Okay, so is this the main shot you'd recommend when you're taking people here? This is the first one that I start with. Yeah. Um, I mean, look at it now, it's just gone. Beautiful. It's a nice simple one because you've got a nice strong primary subject. Mm -hmm. So you've got something that kind of really anchors the shot and then you've got the interest behind it. So it's not just a tree that's coming yeah. out. Yeah. It's a tree coming out mm -hmm. as a, in the Lake District. Yeah. And as you've got the light, I guess, lighting up the hills, it's also reflecting on the water, which gives you that yep. added yeah, detail. Gorgeous. Yes. Right. We've got another, another place to go? Yeah, on to our next location. The Lake District is one of 15 national parks in the UK. There's enough here to keep any landscape photographer happy for days or even weeks, but I can only scratch the surface of what it has to offer in the limited time I had. But nevertheless, Chris was eager to show me as much as possible, choosing locations within easy walking distance of each other so that we didn't waste precious time travelling between photo spots. This is our second location. This is Abbott's Bay. And this is Otter Island. And we've got this lovely shot, you know, perfect for today because we've got lovely still conditions, nice reflections. So lovely side lighting hitting the tree. Lovely side light hitting the, the island. You've got lovely detail in the island. Yeah. And so it's a relatively simple shot. So really quite tight in. Quite tight. And we're just going to portrait orientation again, just fill the frame with the island. Okay, so foreground wise, are we just talking the lake itself or do you want to include any of these rocks and the mosses? We can do, but we can. let's start with a shot of the island okay. and then move Work back. back. Alright. Okay. Cool. So obviously the more you come around to the left, the more space you get on the left hand yeah, side okay. of the island. So it's a, it's a question of sort of getting yourself in, this, in a position where you can get as much space around the island as possible without hitting either this edge here or where the land in the background starts to go up okay. to Walla Crag and that'll keep you a nice simple balanced frame. By the time you set up hopefully the sun will be back out again and we'll be catching the trees. So if you come in here yep. and again nice operating, nice easy operating height of the tripod we don't have to get too low because we haven't got any foreground. Okay so if people want to come here um, what's kind of the best conditions, time of year, time of day? It's reasonably good this time of year when the sun is um, off to the east because we are looking now, we're looking uh, north east and so we've got some side light hitting that. But really, it, to really simplify this scene and, and give yourself some separation from the island in the background because it does sort of cut, blend in a little bit, you want some nice mist. So this works really, really well for mist. Okay. Um, but as long as you've got reflections, you're pretty, well. you're pretty good. I think probably the worst time of year is when the light is directly behind the island. So summer, when the, the sun is rising right to the north, it just throws the island into silhouette mm. and you lose all the detail in yep. the trees. Okay, all right. So, so you want to zoom right in. Subject. Fill the frame with the, keep going. So there you go, something like that. And then just center it, there you go. Perhaps a little bit wider. Wider. So you want it Lovely. centered vertically and horizontally? Yeah, you've got a little bit too much space at the top and not enough at the yeah, bottom, so, so you just want to come down and touch. But it's just very, very simple, not too far, back a bit. Just get nice and balanced, very, very simple, and just letting the subject really speak for itself. Do you want the two-second timer on again? Two-second timer, always the two-second timer. Just to reduce the vibration. Where are we? Here we go. Yeah. All right. Focusing on the island. Yeah. There you go. Simple as that. Very nice. Landscape photography is really all about getting yourself in the right place at the right time. That's pretty good, I would say. That's looking lovely already. Nice bit of detail in the sky. Quick swan. With two locations in the bag, Chris assured me there was still time to squeeze in a third, and despite only having to walk for a couple of minutes, we found ourselves in a totally different environment. Location number three, different again, we've had the lakes. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's the beauty of the Lake District is that there's such a variety of locations. So you know, you, today we would have had cat bells. We've, now, we've been down to the edge of the lake and now we've got something that you don't have on Sky, which is some woodland. And some fine woodland. I mean, look at this in front of us. Absolutely. So this is a beautiful old uh, beech tree. And I first discovered this with a friend of mine uh, back in the summer. And obviously tomorrow, 
is the first day of autumn. And so with this beech tree, what's going to happen is that the leaves will go uh, a beautiful orange colour. So if you get your camera, yeah. and again, th and this shot works in either portrait or landscape, so you pop it on to whichever one you fancy. I think we we'll might try it landscape first, done, it, done a couple that of works, portraits. Yeah. So in landscape orientation, I think what you want to do is you want to push the, the main trunk off to the left hand side. So we're going to need to move forward so that we don't have that. The, this big trunk, yep, yeah. okay. So we'll just pick it up and go. Yep, move forward. That'll do. Oh, there. So there. Past the trunk. So you're in line with the tree now, so it's nowhere near in shot. Okay, I can see this working really well in the mist. Yep. So, what are we aiming for just now then? How many, much of the branches do we want to catch? I think you've done a pretty good job, Ruth. I mean, just make sure it's level. Mm -hmm. Wildly unlevel. <laughs> So exposure-wise, I mean, it's obviously quite tricky conditions today. What, what do you think is the best thing to do with this? I, I think because it's so dark in here, you're not getting any detail in the trees. So if you want to retain detail in both the background and the foreground, I think you really don't have any option but to bracket and, okay. and exposure blend. So these are three fabulous spots obviously but if there's yep. anybody else coming up obviously with autumn coming on is there anywhere else in the lakes that you'd recommend for them obviously lake district works well most locations work well in in the autumn um, i tend to favor uh, um, viewpoints that are looking north or south so i've got the side, nice side light at this time of year um, but you know areas with woodland are obviously going to be popular so on the other side of derwent water we've got borrowdale and then there's some areas around Oldswater, around Aeroforce, the waterfall there, and some lovely shots that you can get up there when there's some colour in the trees. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. All right. A big thanks to Chris for showing me some of his favourite Lake District spots. I can definitely see why this area is such a popular location for landscape photographers. All right, well, you might remember last month we visited pro photographer Mary Law on the Isle of Lewis. And while we were over there, we thought we would take advantage of the unexpected sunshine to shoot a subject that Marcus has been wanting to capture for a while now. It's one of dilapidation, ruin and decay, so it's right up Marcus's street. But no. It's not a self-portrait. The islands of the Outer Hebrides are well visited by photographers who come here to capture the unique landscapes and abundant wildlife on offer. But there is another subject which offers great potential and one which you'll find all over the islands, abandoned houses. We've done a feature all about these before in this show, so check that out if you haven't already seen it. Today, I'm returning to a remote house which I've photographed many times before, as it sits in an idyllic bay next to a small lochan, which is perfect for reflections on a calm day. However, it's not the outside of the house that I'm interested in, it's what's inside, so follow me. These houses get abandoned for a variety of reasons, and when they do, large items of furniture are often left behind. Not only do these tell a story and give us a window into the past, but they also provide the perfect subject matter, especially if they're suitably weathered and decayed. This is what I'm talking about. So when people abandon these houses, they often leave the cooker, otherwise known as an arga, because it's just too heavy. And this house is really quite remote, so um, I certainly wouldn't want to carry that out of here. So they just leave it here, and it's often the only piece of furniture that's left. But I particularly like the colors of this one. It's the beige of the, uh, the oven with the green of the wall behind it. But, as luck would have it, and this wasn't planned, um, the light in here is actually really quite nice at the moment because we've got the sun coming in here and there's a pool of sunlight here and that's going to reflect nicely and give this a luminance that it wouldn't otherwise have. 
and we've got no hot spots either because if the sun was coming in at a different angle and shining on part of the floor then that area is going to burn out obviously so this is perfect really because we've got this beautiful quality of light without any hot spots whatsoever so just a case of getting the camera set up and getting on with it so i've got the 8x10 film camera set up and the reason why i'm using this camera is because i want to be able to um, make a contact print of this particular scene here it's the whole purpose of, of coming here so i have to shoot it on this camera um, but i've got four lenses in the bag and rather than put one on and try it out and see if it's too wide or too short i'm just taking the shortcut i'm using my phone i've got an app on here which uh, shows me the exact angle of view of each lens so i've selected this camera 8x10 camera and i'm looking at a uh, 300 millimeter lens looks pretty good because it's got the oven reasonably big now because this is going to be a contact print it means that the the print's only going to be the same size as the negative so it's going to be 10 by 8 or 8 by 10 depending on which way i choose to shoot it so i want the oven to be reasonably large in frame because the print's only going to be quite small if i shoot this too wide um, it's just going to get lost in amongst all the detail. So um, 300 millimeters looks to be the one at the moment because that allows a nice amount of room around the oven and uh, still keeps it quite big and dominant in the frame. And it looks like an upright is going to be the way to go. So uh, yeah, that's definitely the one. So I'm going to put the 300 millimeter lens on and then get everything lined up. This takes a while, so join me again in a minute. 300 millimeters may sound like a very long focal length for an indoor shot of a small room, but on an 8x10 camera, 300 millimeters is actually only a standard focal length, equivalent to around 50 millimeters on a full frame camera. Although the angle of view offers a standard perspective, neither wide angle nor telephoto, it still has the same shallow depth of field as any other 300mm lens, which at this close distance is only wafer thin. So it's really important that I get the camera back perfectly level so that I don't get any converging verticals going on. Um, so the good thing about having a large format camera like this is you've got all the lens movement so you can control the perspective of everything. However, one temptation, because I've essentially got a tilt shift lens on the front here, would be to put the lens forward and get front to back sharpness. But I think um, this would look better just as a straight shot, just with a focus on the um, oven and just with the foreground kind of like feathering off the, uh, the sharpness. But uh, just got to perfect the uh, composition first. It's very hot under here. It's sometimes possible to frame and compose on a large format camera without having to hide underneath a dark cloth. But due to the huge area of sunlit wall behind me, there's no way I can see anything without plunging myself into darkness. So let's talk about exposure, handheld light meter. And what I'm gonna do is I need to identify the brightest area in this scene that I want to retain detail in and also the darkest area that I want to retain detail in. So if we look over here, um, it's a fairly easy scene to do that with, to be honest, because this here is probably the lightest large area, but there's a lighter area just on the edge of this old uh, toaster here. So if I go close up to this and spot meter off of that, bearing in mind that that's where the light's coming from. So I wouldn't want to do it here because then I'm causing a shadow with my body. So I want to stand to the side and want to meter that and that's telling me f64 at one second but that's telling me that as a mid-tone, I don't want that to be a mid-tone so I would, I'd want to overexpose that by at least three stops so that means that I'm at um, f45 at four seconds which is fine, I want to shoot this at f45 because I want to get as much depth of field as possible um, even at f45 that's going to be way out of focus all the stuff near there so that's the brightest point uh, the darkest area is probably inside the oven here so if I take a meter reading from that again not casting a shadow with my body uh, that's saying f8 at one second so uh, at four seconds 
uh, that's going to be um, f16 at four seconds. So if I do f45 at four seconds, that's going to be uh, four stops on lower than a mid tone, which is absolutely fine. Um, and that's going to be three stops over a mid tone, um, also fine. So um, let's give that a go, see what happens. So finally, this is my light source here. The sun's coming in, shining from this wall, and that's what's illuminating my subject. So clearly, I don't want to be standing like this when I take the photo because I'm blocking a large proportion of this light. So I'm going to have to get down right behind the camera like this, and already I can just see the difference that that's made. It's just made, made about a stop of light difference. It just gives it a much better luminance. So I'm going to put some film in here, take this position, and, uh, and then we'll fire off a shot. Large format film comes in sheets, with each film holder accommodating two sheets, one on each side. So one final piece in the jigsaw puzzle here. Um, I've had a little rethink and I'm going to go F45 at five seconds. Um, putting that into the reciprocity calculator, um, that means my exposure is actually eight seconds. And I'm also racked forward a tiny little bit there on the on the lens because this is reasonably close up so the further away the lens is from the film the, it's called bellows extension uh, the more exposure you have to give it so i'm going to give this 10 seconds and uh, i've decided that here is my optimum position because if i stand behind the camera i'm blocking the light hitting here um, so if i'm here then i'm not so uh, we're going to give this 10 seconds and let's just uh before I pull the dark side out, just going to have a quick test fire. Uh, that's all working good. So, dark slide is out. Let the camera stop vibrating. And then we're going to go and open. Find my best not to move. Three, two, one and we're closed. Whew. And we'll put this dark side back in, turning it round of course, so that I know which side has been exposed. And that is a shot on large format, which, if it's all worked out correctly, looks something like this. Here's the negative, which is obviously exactly what the camera captured. As I mentioned earlier, the reason for shooting on this camera was to be able to make a contact print, which is the sharpest possible way to get a print, as there's no enlargement required and no lens to have to focus the image through. There are a number of easy ways to achieve a contact print, but the one I'm doing here is called a calotype, a process which dates back to the late 1800s, around the same time that this oven was roasting a chicken. So it seems more fitting than a modern day inkjet print. You can do this process with a digital photo too, something which we'll be showing you how to do in an upcoming show. But for now, this print here represents something of a rarity these days, in that it has never been in a digital format, although you're obviously seeing it digitized here on YouTube. It has never been enlarged, meaning that it's the exact same size as the camera captured it, and that it hasn't been manipulated or edited in any way as this process doesn't allow for any local adjustments to be made. Basically, it's about as genuine and as authentic as a photo can ever be. And for me, that makes the satisfaction of the shot all the more pertinent. While we were on the Outer Hebrides, we also took a few other photos along the same theme. If those kinds of subjects interest you, then we always include them on our annual photo holidays to the islands in February and March. When the landscape is dramatic, very photogenic, and the light is often the best it ever gets. There are still places available for next year, so do get in touch for more details. Okay, well, at the start of the show, I asked what was the programme that became Photoshop originally called? Was it 
A, Pro Edit, B, Image Flow, C, Photo Suite, or D, Image Pro? The correct answer is D. Photoshop was created by the Knoll brothers in 1987 as Image Pro. It was bought by Adobe to create what we now know as Photoshop. So we're out of time, but as always, we'll be back in just a couple of weeks when, among other things, we'll be chatting to the man behind the newly remastered Apollo Moon Photos. So do join us for that. Until next time, take good care. But most of all, take good photos. It's worth remembering. Is it worth remembering? Is that how it starts? It's probably worth remembering. So if you're bringing people here, if people want to come by here, by Babylon, if you're there. Yeah. So, yeah. Hang on, I'll do that again. I would if I were you. Yeah, okay. The rainbow almost disappears and becomes completely invisible. No, it doesn't come become completely invisible. Almost. All right, well, you might reverse your hand. Sorry, hair in the mouth. Depending on this distance, they appear either bigger or smaller to our eyes as we use this. No, we don't. No, we don't. Along the same kind of theme. So, if those kinds of images, is it z b z b z subjects? The fact that the colours of a second rainbow are. are blah, 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 blah. B, image flow. C, image suite. Photo flute. Sorry, image photo suite. By moving ourselves left and right, the rainbow will move left and right. So we can position it. Oh, for goodness sake, what are you talking about? <laughs>